Okay, well, welcome everybody. This is the uh, the February membership meeting for Active Claremont. Uh, we have a great program tonight. Um, we're gonna start off with a couple of announcements. Um, if you see me looking off to the side, I'm looking at my notes here on my other screen. Um, for all those that don't know, my name is Joe. I'm the president of Active Claremont uh, for this year. And a couple announcements to get started. Uh, first and foremost, we have a trash pickup, our very favorite event. We have a trash pickup this Saturday. It's going to be at 8 a.m. St. Luke's Church. Uh, we're going to meet at the northeast corner in the parking lot there. We'll have all the supplies, um, bags, pickers, all that good stuff. Um, all you have to do is sign in on the sign-in sheet, and we're good to go. So that event is open to members and non-members alike. Uh, if you're going to bring a non-member, please let us know, because we do need to do some paperwork in order to get them set up appropriately. Um, again, that'll be at 8 o'clock. We usually go until about 10 or 10.30. So you're more than welcome to come and hang out with us and clean up the city a little bit. And that's along Baseline Road there. Um, another thing that I uh, am very excited to announce, um, and the board and I, uh, or all of us, have been working on um, uh, being a part of the CERT car show. So uh, Claremont Emergency Response Team, Community Emergency Response Team is going to be having a, a fundraiser for a car show at Claremont Toyota. That's going to take place April 10th. And um, although we don't have an official co-sponsor or an official arrangement, uh, this was an event that I saw and I felt like, hey, uh, Claremont Cert and Active Claremont those are two organizations that go hand in hand, um, helping the community, volunteering, uh, awareness. And I thought to myself, hey, this could be a great opportunity to kind of leverage both organizations' networks and have some people that maybe didn't know about the other organization uh, participate. So uh, I myself, I'm actually going to enter one of my vehicles into the car show. Um, I'll be there and uh, we're going to be walking around. We're going to have our uh, active Claremont shirts on, and we're going to be talking to people, uh, saying hi to people, meeting people. So um, it's going to be a great event. It's for a wonderful cause. It's going to benefit all of us. Again, that's April 10th at Claremont Toyota, and that's the CERT Car Show. Uh, first annual. So this is your opportunity to be on the ground floor of an annual event. Uh, so that'll be happening as well. Also, we are still working uh, as an organization. We're working on a few different programs to hopefully increase some membership. I touched on this last meeting, and uh, uh, the board is working diligently to come to a very um, precise uh, system so that we can hopefully grow some membership, uh, both in uh, uh, amongst um, uh, middle-aged and older citizens, as well as younger uh, citizens in, in Claremont, uh, focusing primarily on maybe getting some um, college students involved in volunteering and activism. Um, we feel that that's a good outlet that we can reach. And with our wonderful Claremont colleges just down the street, we feel like that there could be um, a lot of people that want to be more active in the local Claremont community. Um, so without any further ado, uh, we... Joe, oh, yes, Brian, what do you have for me? That you were talking about the students. If yes. they're volunteers, uh, you might let them know they're coming in free. Yes, that is, that's a wonderful, wonderful note. Yes, for students that are going to volunteer, um, we're able to do, uh, we've decided that we're going to, we're going to waive the membership fee. Um, the, the active Claremont membership fee is very steep at 10 whole dollars. So we did, yes, I know, Meg, it's, oof. So we decided that for students that are going to participate, um, uh, we're, we're going to waive that fee, and we feel like it's a, it's a very uh, symbiotic relationship. They get to experience some uh, community volunteerism and activism, and we get some fresh young blood to help us pick up more trash and do more things. So uh, thank you, Brian, for, for mentioning that. Also, uh, one other thing, uh, as, you, as both Lisa and Meg uh, saw, we're going to be recording this. Yes. Just because you don't see that many on the screen, it's on YouTube and we'll, it'll be telecast for the whole, not only this month, but it'll be telecast next month. So don't think it's just this group and it's, it will get spread out and it's, and I'm excited about it. I really am both, both of you putting on that one that I saw at the Sustainable Claremont. That was great. That's why I was excited about this one. Yeah, and on top of that, um, after the meeting is over, once the recording is up on YouTube, I will send out an email. Uh, usually, I'll, I'll send it out sometimes Friday, sometimes Monday, it just kind of depends on, on, on the day and activity. But I will send out an, what we call an in case you missed it email, which basically will recap a little bit about what we talked about. And it will have a link to this exact presentation on, on, 
our YouTube channel. So people will be able to see it. And likewise, if anybody from uh, your organization wants to distribute this, you're more than welcome to pass along that link. It will be on the active Claremont YouTube channel and it'll be in a link that I can email to you all. So you can pass that along if you want to. Um, okay. And that brings us to our presentation for tonight. Um, so we're going to uh, be talking with Claremont Wildlands Conservancy. We have three members, Arlene Andrew, uh, Meg Matthews, and Alyssa Peterson. And they're going to talk about some of the things that um, Claremont Wildlands Conservancy is doing. Essentially, it, it's, it's, it's great because the name is very pertinent to what you, <laughs> what the organization is about. So it takes a lot of the guesswork out. But um, essentially, we're you know uh, talking about preserving Claremont's open space um, and uh, how that can benefit Claremont and uh, the resources that we have to sort of conserve the open and natural spaces that we have and which obviously is a huge part of the community. It's a huge part of Claremont. We're a foothill community. Um, and, I, and, and growing up, I always thought that was a really neat thing. Uh, you know, uh, when you go up into the mountains and you look and you think, wow, there's, there's nobody above us. We're it. That's where the where the where the we're as far north as you get until you get into the desert and everybody is down there. So it's kind of interesting to be tied so close to the mountains, um, and and it, it's a huge part of our community. So without any further ado, uh, Meg, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, you can go mm -hmm. ahead and do that, and we will we will get going. Okay, and I'm I'm the start person. Perfect. I need to see the screen. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay, so I'm Arlene, Andrew, Lissa, Meg, and I are going to tell you about the Claremont Hills Wilderness Park. Um, I will talk about the city's growth and hillside policies. You want to do the next slide? I'm pressing the button and it's not responding. That's interesting. There we go. I can do it this way. Okay. Okay, good. Um, I'll talk about the city's growth and hillside policies, and Lissa will discuss the park's beginnings, the expansion, and the master plan, and Meg will talk about the future. Up until 1997, except for a 40-acre parcel, not yet, um, <laughs> except for a 40-acre parcel called Sycamore Canyon, undeveloped hillside land north of the flatlands of Claremont was in private hands. Today, 2,500 out of 3,100 hillside acres are within the boundaries of the park. So how did this change come about? This is the story of how Claremont gradually expanded north to the hillsides and how the wilderness park evolved. In the beginning, abundant hillside plants, trees, animals, and water helped indigenous populations flourish before colonists came and displaced them. In the late 19th century, with the arrival of the railroad and the establishment of colleges and towns in the area, local students and residents started venturing up to the hillsides. The C.C. Johnson family, who purchased hillside land, picnicked and hiked there. And later, Claremont residents planted flowers and trees on what became known as Johnson's Pasture. Nearby property owned by the Gale family flourished as an Angora goat ranch. Claremont for decades was confined to the town site around the railroad depot, but gradually grew north to Foothill Boulevard, seen in the lower right-hand corner of the photo. It arrived in Claremont in 1931 through the efforts of Frank Wheeler called the grandfather of Foothill Boulevard. And you can see the high school off on the right side. Go ahead, it's okay. Um, housing in the Hillsides was initiated in 1925 by H.H. H. Garner, who developed the Padua Hills neighborhood. His intention was to build an elegant community fostering artists and not, in Garner's words, a honky-tonk place. In 1930, he and his wife, Bess Garner, established the Padua Hills Theater that you see in the slide. As Claremont grew, the flat lands between the town center and the hills were planted with vast acres of citrus trees. By the 1950s, development was creeping north and the city was growing, but the hillsides remained unincorporated county land. And now a little bit about city policies. 
The city's leaders saw a need to establish rules to steer future growth in a manner acceptable, acceptable to its citizens. So in 1956, they adopted a general plan. General plans are meant to encapsulate a city's vision for its future and to establish foundational policies and programs. They cover topics such as housing, open space, circulation, and many, many more. State law requires a city's zoning and other ordinances to be consistent with its general plan. Now, we're in the, 19, in the mid 1960s when several large hillside parcels were annexed to the city. A dense hillside development at the top of Mountain Avenue named Claraboya shocked Claremont residents into the realization that the hills could be covered with housing if something wasn't done to control development. See that photo on the right, uh, courtesy of the Claremont Courier. Claraboya is now a fine neighborhood of mostly mid-century modern homes with spectacular views, all the more special because it is the only such neighborhood in Claremont. Johnson's Arlene, Arlene, yeah. is there a chance, just, I hate to interrupt you, but this just, I meant to say something last time with yeah. Lisa and, Meg and you here, but you've got this picture of Claremont up in uh, Claraboya, and you said in the 60s, I work all the irrigation that goes to all of the trees that you're looking at. I put all of the trees in, there was five of us working up there, and the ground is so hard that we had to use jackhammers to put the, you know, and get a four by four hole so we could plant that little itty bitty tree. And I go up there and every time I go up there, I take the grandkids and I tell them, you see all these trees, grandpa and four other guys are plant, we planted every one of them and all the irrigation system that goes with it was all fabulous. Well, then you're, you're, okay. No, you were part of Claremont's history, and this is a very good thing to know. Thank you, Brian. It was really great, but all those trees were planted on the side of those hills behind those houses. Yeah, and we can see the trees in that in that photo. That's, so. a, that's a great picture. Anyway, I'll shut up. Go ahead. Okay, <laughs> okay thank you. Um, okay, so Johnson's, um, uh, Johnson's Pasture... Uh, immediately north of Claraboya was to be Claraboya phase two. Mid 1970s owners, American Savings and Loan, attempted unsuccessfully to receive approval to build 356 houses there based on the zoning at the time of two dwelling units per acre. That map, that little map on the left, uh, shows the layout of the Claraboya lots and the arrow, that blue arrow above, shows Johnson's pasture. According to historian Judy Wright, next slide, the hillsides could have ultimately been developed with almost 7,000 homes based on that zoning in the 1970s. And the next slide, the, the first glimmer of an idea for parkland in the hillsides may have come about when the Claraboya developers deeded to the city 40 acres, Sycamore Canyon, on the north side of the Thompson Creek Channel in exchange for higher density. The arrow, that red arrow on the left points to Claraboya and the arrow on the right points to Sycamore Canyon and the photo shows some hikers enjoying Sycamore Canyon. And then the next slide. The League of Women Voters played a pivotal role in moving the city to adopt regulations that would ultimately preserve hillside land. Their 1977 study, Claremont Hillside Development, looked at issues such as fire, water, seismic danger, and the costs and benefits of hillside development. It contained recommendations for the Planning Commission and City Council to consider. It cites pros and cons of each recommendation, pointing out that although hillside housing would generate tax revenue, the costs of providing services, police, fire, street cleaning, trash collection, et cetera, especially in a hillside area, would exceed those tax revenues. In 1977, the city adopted a natural environment element of the general plan. It established the foundation for a hillside zoning ordinance that could protect large portions of hillside land. League members Judy Wright and Diane Ring played an important role in, then and in future years. Without the league's leadership, the Claremont Hills Wilderness Park might never have come into being. That photo on the left 
uh, from the, is from the league study and that line across um, is the national forest boundary. In the next slide, the league's work stimulated creation of a task force made up of residents, realtors, members of local organizations, commissioners, and council members. They tried to balance environmental concerns, property owners' rights, and community values. At first, they considered simple slope density zoning. This zoning would allow more houses on flatter land and fewer houses on steeper, more remote land. However, it would have resulted in enorm an enormous amount of grading, you see here, uh, to create streets like Clara Boyas Mountain Avenue. In the next slide. So the city hired planning consultant, George Mader, known for skill in preserving hillside environments, and San Francisco attorney, Antonio Rossman, to work with the task force. Rossman was able to make a convincing and legally sound case for adapting a concept conceived for historic building preservation to land preservation. The result was adoption in 1981 of a groundbreaking hillside ordinance that contain, contains a transfer of development credit scheme that allows houses to be built in certain cluster areas that are flatter and closer to roads and utilities, but allows owners of land not in cluster areas to have the potential for some economic use of their land. Cities cannot simply zone away the value of a piece of land by, for example, designating it as open space. The ordinance, which was unsuccessfully fought by several opponents, was based on a concept that originated in New York City to preserve iconic Grand Central Station, which sat on land zoned for a skyscraper. Developers wanted to build a tall building on the site. Preservationists came up with the idea of having Grand Central sell its air rights, the right to build a very tall building to a property elsewhere in Manhattan. This would enable the second owner to build a taller skyscraper than was allowed under its current zoning. The concept was legally challenged. The case went to the Supreme Court and ultimately the val validity of the transfer concept was established. So it's legal to do that. With Rossman's guidance, Claremont adapted the concept, but referred to it as a transfer of development credits scheme to avoid implying that there was a right to build groups of houses on remote steep land. Consultant George Mader studied every privately owned undeveloped hillside parcel. Using topographic maps, he estimated the number of houses that could in theory, but not in actuality, be built based on a sloped density formula. The steeper the slopes and the further from a road and utilities, the, further, the fewer the number of housing units or credits were assigned to that parcel. Each one of those little yellow tags there has a number. Housing could be built only in the flatter, less remote cluster areas shown on the map. And the map on the left slide has notes indicating the number of development credits assigned to each parcel. And then the map on the right shows the original cluster areas where houses could be built. The owner of a cluster area, no, not, uh, there we go. The owner of a cluster area after buying credits could then build more houses pending city approval, including meeting general plan policies, environmental quality provisions, and all zoning requirements. The ultimate goal was for the credits from, a donor par from donor parcels to be legally and permanently extinguished, and the parcels remain as open space forever. Here's a simple example of a parcel with 38 credits on the left that is requesting two credits to build a total of 40 houses. The owner buys two credits from a neighbor with six credits, leaving the neighbor with four and the receding parcel with 40, as you see in, on the right. The ordinance has been used only once to create the neighborhood known as Stone Creek, also called Stone Canyon, shown in purple. Land owned by the Garner family, about 1400 acres, was bequeathed to Pomona College by alumnus H.H. H. Garner in 1980. 
A dozen or so years later, negotiations between the city and the college resulted in development credits from 1,220 of Pomona College's acres being transferred to that cl cluster. The 1,220 acres became the Wilderness Park. The cluster got an increase in density, which increased its value. And Pomona College was able to sell the cluster to a developer who built the houses you see north of Baldy Road at Padua Avenue. So, and now Lissa will go into detail about the negotiations with Pomona College, the beginnings of the Wilderness Park and later acquisitions. Hey, I'd like to just thank you, Arlene. Um, I'd just like to start by showing you the Wilderness Park, especially for those of you who haven't spent much time up there. So you can see why we love it, why we want to save it, and why we want to expand it. So we'll just take a minute to look at some pictures. Okay, now we'll get into the talk. This, um, this aerial view shows you the urban wildland interface as it is today. Uh, Laverne is to the left and you can see the development that has um, extended well up into the foothills on the, on the uh, far left side. And Claremont is to the right with the urban area extending up along Mount Baldy Road. Um, suburban sprawl, could have been, as Arlene said, it could have been all over the foothills. And in 1974, they were all in private hands. All of the foothills in Claremont were in private hands. Um, this map shows instead what's happened since then. Uh, so here's what we have today. To orient you, the red arrow Mark's Clara Boya at the top of Mountain Avenue. And you're gonna see it again and again, and the red arrow is always Clara Boya. And the green arrow marks the main entrance to Claremont's Wilderness Park at the top of Mills Avenue. And you will see that again. So just keep an eye on those two arrows to get keep yourself oriented. The 2,500 acres of the Claremont Hills Wilderness Park are in green. And what those are, uh, those are all the parcels uh, that are outlined um, and those parcels make up the Wilderness Park. They were added to it over the years. And the parcels in blue on the left are Marshall Canyon Regional Park, which extends all the way to Glendora. The red outline <laughs> is Clara Oaks, which Meg will be talking to you about later. That is a parcel that we, um, we are working on acquiring to add to the park. Our long range vision at Claremont Wildlands Conservancy is to have parkland across all of Claremont's foothills, extending westward to link scattered green spaces into a continuous wildland corridor. And our grand vision, which may or may not ever come to pass, would be to have that wildland continue as far west as Monrovia with, um, with a continuous green corridor. Um, the next slide shows you a table. This is a chart of the acquisitions, all of those parcels that were added to Claremont's Park over the years. Um, in the second column, you could see the names of the parcels. And um, in the fourth column where it says source, that's the funding source column. You can see where the money has come from for the parcels that were purchased. Um, or traded in some way or other. You can see there've been negotiations, there've been donations, but there has also been funding that has come from state grants. And I'll talk about some of those in a few minutes. Only one parcel is mostly from local funds and that's Johnson's Pasture, the 2007 um, purchase. So I'll just let you look at this a minute while I 
keep talking. This, um, this chart makes it look like there was a very neat logical progression from the vision of the Claremont Hills Wilderness Park to the reality that we have today. That's just not the case. The vision emerged over many years in kind of fits and starts. There, there was never one clear vision back at the beginning that got accomplished in the end. As Arlene said, Sycamore Canyon along the eastern side of Clara Boya became a park in 1975. That's the first um, parcel. The city council created this park as she explained, but most likely those council members expected the rest of the foothills would be developed in the future. After all, they were all in private hands. That council made no plan <laughs> for any future parkland in the foothills. In 1981, the city of Claremont adopted the new hillsides ordinance with development credits as Arlene explained and what that did was to start to open people's minds to a vision of Claremont's hillsides remaining green because the pockets of development would leave large swaths of natural open space. Well, with the ordinance in place, the next significant event was the opening of the original Claremont Hills Wilderness Park in 1997. And as Arlene said, it was 1,220 acres. It was huge. And returning to this map, which you saw earlier, um, there is, uh, note the red arrow is Clara Boya to get you oriented. The light green arrow is the top of Mills Avenue at the entrance to the park. Um, this shows you the original park. The striped parcels make up the original park. And you can see it's a little bit disjointed. Um, it's, it's not completely solid. Um, there are parcels here and there but that is the original wilderness park. The dark gray areas are the cluster areas um, and the white parcels were privately owned at the time. Okay, uh, this is the loop trail. And for people who use the park outside of Claremont, I think most park visitors think that the Claremont Wilderness Park is the loop. They call <laughs> it the loop. So um, it's only part of the park, but many people see that as the park because that's the most visited area. It's the most well-known area. It's about five miles long, uphill and downhill. Um, and it's mostly located within the original 1997 Wilderness Park. It begins at the top of Mills and the green arrow here shows you that top of Mills entrance. The blue ar arrow is aimed at the loop. So you can just see that kind of irregular oval shape there. That's the loop trail. And red arrow again marks Clara Boya. Okay, this is the loop today. It is, as you can <laughs> see, very popular. <laughs> now, what I wanna to talk to you about right now is how, how, did, how did the original park happen? How, how did it come about? It took, and, and um, Arlene gave you the big picture, but I'm going to go into some more detail here. It took eight years, eight years of deliberations with the city and the owner of the land, Pomona College, falling in and out of agreements. I want to tell you just about one breakthrough meeting so you can get a sense of just how zigzaggy this, this process was. Two Pomona College professors met with the city manager at the time, Glenn Southerd, Mayor Diane Ring, and Councilwoman Judy Wright. Both Judy and Diane had been League of Women Voters presidents, and they had both worked on the original 1977 Hillside study uh, that the League put out. The initial assumption, assumptions going into this meeting were that Pomona would develop the cluster area on the flatland along Mount Baldy Road, the area that's now Stone Creek, and Pomona would donate the hillside land to a nature conservancy. The city's main concern was to prevent development in the hillsides, not to create a park to prevent development. Suddenly someone from the city said, in the middle of this meeting, why don't we buy it? Meaning, why don't we buy all of it? Um, there was this, people who were at that meeting say there was a long stunned silence because nobody 
Nobody had thought of that, but that's what they did. They agreed that the city would buy all of the land from Pomona, sell the cluster to a developer and retire the development credits on the hillside parcels. They still weren't thinking about a park. They were just thinking about preventing development. So the city started making monthly payments to Pomona College. In the end, the city paid over a million dollars, but with about a year later, there was an economic downturn and the city could no longer afford to make the monthly payments. So it was in danger of defaulting. But thanks to the good relationships that had developed through all these negotiations, Pomona agreed to let the city keep the hillside land in exchange for the city's help and financial help with the entitlement process and the specific plan for the cluster area and, and for the hillside development credits, which the city transferred to Pomona's cluster, as Arlene explained, which made it more valuable. So the deal smoothed the way for Pomona to sell the cluster area to a developer. Today, that is the Stone Creek neighborhood with about 125 homes along Baldy Road. So the determination of the city's negotiators to protect the hillsides led them further. It led them to create the original Claremont Hills Wilderness Park. Still in the 1990s, there were large cluster areas for housing in the hillsides. Johnson's pasture was the largest and the most valuable, vulnerable and valuable. Uh, by 1999, Johnson's pasture faced a serious new threat of development. Its 180 acres could be developed with 125 houses or more. So in 2000, three local women formed Claremont Wildlands Conservancy, which we're all on the board of today, the three of us, or, and I'm just gonna call it CWC so that, keep it simple. And CWC had a very narrowly focused goal, save Johnson's pasture. This was at a time when everyone expected it to be developed. One of the three women was Suzanne Thompson. She was the main leader of CWC for the first 10 years, and she and other founders made the organization a nonprofit, raised money, and recruited members. Crucially, they formed a partnership with the national nonprofit Trust for Public Land, which has an office in Pasadena. And we are still working very closely with Trust for Public Land and would not be able to achieve what we have without it. In October 2003, many of you may remember the Padua wildfire swept through, swept through the foothills on Santa Ana winds. It destroyed 66 houses in Claremont alone and uh, damaged another 23. And that reminded everyone of the hazards of developing in the foothills. The fire also further motivated the city, which now had a wilderness park and wanted it to grow. So in 2003 and 2004, the city added three more parcels to the park and they're marked there with green arrows. The light gray parcels here were still privately owned. And as you can see, the black parcels were part of, were the original wilderness park. Now, how did the city do this? Well, with strong city council backing, city manager Glenn Souther deputized his young assistant, Jim Lewis, who's now the city manager of Pismo Beach, to work with CWC and the Trust for Public Land to buy up more parcels. Jim and the Trust for Public Land project manager went out and negotiated deals with three willing sellers. And then they went to the state and secured state funds for the purchases. None of that money was Claremont money. By now, the vision of a grand wilderness park over much of Claremont's hillsides was becoming a reality. And the next prize was Johnson's Pasture, marked here with the blue arrow on the map. Uh, it became part of the park, as, as I said, in 2007. You can see in the next photo why it's so special. Here, here are some of the eucalyptus trees that were planted by the Johnson's friends in the first half of the 1900s. 
CC and Louisa Johnson were the original owners and namesakes. In 1950, Louisa died and the land was sold to the Musgrove brothers for $750,000. In 1960, the brothers sold the land, the lower slopes to the developers of Claraboya. Johnson's pasture, as Arlene said, was to be Claraboya II. And if you look at this map, you can see why. That blue rectangle is approximately where Johnson's pasture is located. And you can see just below it, Claraboya comes right up to it and it would have just kept on going. Um, if the, that plan had been followed. But a merciful bankruptcy prevented the development in the 1970s, the Musgrove brothers plans. In the 1980s, three developers walked away after failing to overturn the transfer of development credits provision in the city's ordinance. But by 1999, with a strong economy, another developer was seriously interested. Johnson's Pasture is the only parcel in the park that's mostly paid for by Claremont taxpayers. And we're still paying for 30 years um, for it on our property taxes. Success in saving it was the result of two intense political campaigns in one year, and that was 2006. The land was originally appraised at $12 million. At first, the city council and voters all agreed that they wanted to save it, but they disagreed on how to pay for it with a parcel tax or a bond measure. A parcel tax requires a majority vote. A bond measure requires two thirds. The enthusiastic but divisive summer campaign for a parcel tax failed miserably. When the mail-in ballots were counted on July 25th, 55% opposed and only 44% favored um, the parcel tax for funding Johnson's pasture. But the opponents still claimed they supported the purchase, they just didn't like the financing method. So right after the loss, a unanimous city council and voters, liberals and conservatives, all came together to buy Johnson's pasture with a general obligation bond, and they put it on the November ballot. CWC, some council members and including Corey Kalaikai and many community members organized an all out campaign, yes on measure S. On the campaign committee of 25, nine members were CWC board members. Well, college students made t-shirts, which you can see on the two hikers here. Supporters posted yard signs. Artists held benefit concerts, or I mean shows, not concerts. CWC circulated brochures like this one. Supporters sent mailers, walked door to door, lobbied at grocery stores, gave talks, wrote letters to the editor, drove voters to the polls, became poll watchers. College students convinced friends to register to vote in Claremont and to get out and vote. CWC board members made thousand dollar pledges. At one point, they even delivered a wagon load of letters to the city council during a council meeting. The result, 72% voted yes. We saved Johnson's pasture. On the right side of this front page courier photo of the celebration is Suzanne Thompson, who was at the time president of CWC and co-chair of the Yes on Measure S campaign. Two secrets of the success were that we had no organized opposition. The campaign included everyone. And Johnson's Pasture really is the well-loved crown jewel of the hillsides that the campaign had claimed it was. Well, moving on, in 2010 and 2011, Trust for Public Land and Claremont Wildlands Conservancy worked with the city to acquire Gale Ranch with state grant funding. The arrow marks the property, the green arrow. Two state agencies agreed to split the cost of 4.8 million. Now, Gale Ranch is important because it's strategically located between Johnson's Pasture and the main park entrance on Mills Avenue. 
the Gale family that ran that Angora goat ranch, they, they had owned it for over a hundred years, but they sold it in 1984 and it was sold again before becoming part of the park. From 2013 to 2016, the city developed its Hillsides Master Plan with a lot of support from Claremont Wildlands Conservancy. Now, why do it? Why even have a master plan? Well, by 2013, the park's popularity had exploded with a little help from Yelp. Estimates were over 320,000 visits a year. Neighbors became concerned about noise and rightfully concerned about noise, traffic, parking, pedestrian safety, trash. The city council expanded the parking lots and added fees for parking. It responded to complaints as they arose by instituting residential permit parking on one street and then another and then another. But it was a kind of reactive piecemeal approach. And so CWC urged the council to create a master plan for overall management of the park. And the city did. It had three goals, to preserve the park as an environmental resource, to provide passive recreation for visitors and to minimize the negative impacts on neighbors. After extensive community involvement, the city adopted the Hillsides Master Plan in 2016. As a result, today, the city has a robust ranger program and a loyal volunteer group called Friends of the Park. Trust for Public Land calls our park one of the best managed, if not the best managed park, wilderness park in the San Gabriels. The final two additions to the park were donations. The first was the 463 acres of Evie Canyon in 2017. See the green arrow and the green parcels up there? That's Evie Canyon. Well, they belong to Pomona College and Pomona saw how well managed the park was and how safe it was from development. So it donated the Evie Canyon parcels to the park, to the city for the park. And on this map, you can see the park as it, almost as it is today. There's one more addition that I'll tell you about next. The yellow is the original park of 1,220 acres from 1997. The tan stripes are the parcels that were added from 2003 to 2011. And the blank white areas are parcels that are still in private hands. The next three slides are just pictures of Evie Canyon because it is so beautiful. I wanted you to see it. It's a, it's a wonderful gift that Pomona College gave to all of us. Finally, um, next slide, please. In 2020, the Bertolina family donated their 20 acres west of Johnson's Pasture to the city for the park. The red arrow shows you where it is, and it's a slim little piece of land. Um, CWC worked very closely with the family and the city to make this happen. And CWC even contributed to the closing costs because the city was having financial problems at that time. This parcel is really important because you can see how it forms a bridge to the wildland corridor to the west, which is in the county. That's Marshall Can part of Marshall Canyon uh, Regional. Oops. Okay. To review, um, just stepping back and looking at the big picture now, just as the city's vision of the hillsides has evolved over the years, so has Claremont Wildlands Conservancy's vision. Uh, from its urgent initial focus on just saving Johnson's pasture, CWC's mission today has four main prongs. The first is to conserve all of Claremont's foothills within the Wilderness Park. That, that's our goal. It may never happen, but we would like to have it happen. That's what we're working toward. Connecting the park to a continuous wildland corridor along the San Gabriel foothills, assuring public access for park visitors and for passive recreational uses. And finally, educating visitors on the importance of appreciating and protecting the park and its natural resources. 
Now, um, Meg is gonna tell you about our current effort to expand the park. Meg, I think you're muted. You're muted. Thank you and thanks, Lucerne, for that trans transition. Uh, while this slide is up in front of us, um, so far we've reviewed the history of the park and the role that the Claremont Wild, uh, Wildlands Conservancy has played in helping it grow parcel by parcel to form that green beltway in our hill hillsides. But now we'll focus on our current efforts to obtain the Clara Oaks property, which is shown here in pink, as another important bridge property across toward the west. Just as the Bertolina property is a bridge that extends the wildlands and joins Greenland together, so Clara Oaks will help us fill in those graphs. Um, you'll become familiar with this sort of up down, upside down L shape as we go through the next several maps. This is a bit closer view of the Clara Oaks property uh, to show you its location just west of Clara Boya, which is here, and just north of the Webb schools, uh, which are just south of, of the property. Uh, and while I have this slide up, let me explain this funny little slash that occurs across the Northwest corner. It's owned by the LA County Fire Department and is a debris basin uh, in case of wildfire, clearing the hillsides, mudslides, debris coming down. This is a channel that would collect that material so that it wouldn't go on to houses and roads below. Now, a little bit of history. 2016, Randy Lim, who is a Canadian developer, purchased this 103 acre parcel. He named it Clara Oaks and had the intention of putting between 40 and uh, 45 luxury homes on it. But in the spring of 2018, after two years of planning and a Claremont community meeting that was not terribly encouraging, Randy offered the land to the Wildlands Conservancy to be added to the park. We enlisted the help of our partners at Trust for Public Land and in August 2018, the land was appraised at a value of 22 of excuse me, 7.2 million dollars. And Randy agreed that this was a fair price that would cover the cost of his purchase price and his and the expenditures to that point in time. However, the next year, after exploring various sources of funding, it seemed as if 7.2 million was going to be a very heavy lift for us and we might not be able to make it. So in the summer of 2019, as a backup plan, Randy started the entitlement process with the city of Claremont, which involves an em environmental impact report. And that process is currently being carried out. He remains willing to sell, but he's continuing to pursue the development possibility as just to protect his investment. And we believe that if the land were entitled for development, that the value would probably, the appraisal would probably increase to about 15 million. This next map is from the Clara Oaks specific plan project, uh, the initial study, and it's av in, available on the California Environmental Quality Act site. Here's our familiar Clara Oaks property in the middle and the, Various coding on the land, on the map show different potential hazard features, liquefaction zones, landslide areas, etc. What's of most concern to us is about the upper two thirds of the map is shown with these diagonal black lines, and they indicate that the property is in an extremely high fat fire hazard severity zone. In fact, if we look historically, that land over the last 100 years has suffered about seven different major wildfires. I'm gonna show you three of them. 1962, here's the footprint of that fire. 1979, another fire that covered that area. The 2003 Padua fire that Lisa referred to earlier, sometimes called the Grand Prix fire, uh, also was extensive through the hill, hillsides there. 
And if you do an overlay of the last seven, five, the seven that have occurred in the last hundred years, you can see that Claraboya is like ground zero, absolutely a hot spot where so many of them overlap. Here's our familiar Claraboya footprint again over here. And this left-hand map is one you've seen a couple of times before. It shows the cluster areas, uh, Stone Creek development here, Johnson's pasture, which was saved from development. The third major cluster area has this little bulge that extends up into the Claraboya footprint. And on the right-hand map, you can see that that's the little area where the developer would plan to put all those homes. Well, while we're looking at this, notice also that there are three roads serving those household lots and they converge into one road, which dumps into Webb Canyon Road at the Red X. Having talked about the danger of fire, we're obviously very concerned about this limited uh, egress point. So if we look at a drive up Webb, Webb Canyon Road, you come to a sign, first of all, as we've talked about, that says danger, extreme fire hazard area. And then you see a sign that says subject to flood. And then there's a narrow, the road narrows here. And then a narrow road goes over a narrow uh, curve and a narrow one-way bridge, one lane bridge, and is bounded on both sides by heritage live oaks which are protected, but would be, uh, could be sacrificed, would have to be sacrificed if that road were widened. So all of these aspects of it give us great concern about development in that area. But rather than just focusing on why we shouldn't develop in the Clara Oaks Room, I'd like to turn to a couple of shots of why we should. The wildlife that is supported in that area, we see deer, bear, Weedpeckers, Bobcat here. All of these pictures were taken by uh, Paul Faustich, who's a professor of environmental studies at Pitzer College and has these uh, motion activated cameras that he has set up to capture the wildlife. These animals are supported by the vegetation and terrain of the Clara Oaks parcel. And if this parcel were added to the, could be bought and added to the Claremont Hills Wilderness Park, it would also help support the population of human animals who enjoy the park. This chart is from the master plan that Lisa mentioned that was done for the wilderness park. Uh, in this case, something over 2000 uh, park visitors were surveyed and this shows the zip codes from which they came in order to visit our park. Obviously 91711 had the largest number, almost 18% of the visitors. But what that means is that about 82% of the visitors were from non-91711 zip codes. And this is not a complete chart, it's just the top 21 that shows the most frequent as they were recorded. What this shows is that the Claremont uh, Hills Wilderness Park, even though it's owned by the city of Claremont as a city park, actually serves as a regional park and has many, many more visitors. And that's illustrated when we look at the same data a different way. These, this shows the, in black, heavy black outline, the zip codes from which our visitors are drawn. Uh, Claremont 91711 is shown up here outlined in green and the park itself is filled in in green. Clara Oaks is shown with a little blue star. But what this also shows is that all of these red ar arrows, or red blocks, red uh, areas, indicate disadvantaged communities. So within the zone of individuals served by our park are several individuals from communities that are designated as disadvantaged that having access to the open space of the park is extremely important. And this fact that we serve as a regional park for these folks uh, is a, a factor that is important to us in asking for some of the grants that we apply for. So just to kind of summarize, adding this property, this beautiful property to Claremont's Wilderness Park 
will preserve the land from development. It'll protect the native vegetation, help form our continuous wildlife cor wildlands corridor in the foothills and prevent building homes into fire prone territory. So this is a lovely idea, but of course the bottom line is it takes funding to do it. These state and county agencies are possible funding sources and the Trust for Public Land with whom we have collaborated and partnered through much of the history of the organization has expertise in submitting grant applications to them. But all granting agencies want to know that there's community support for such an acquisition and they often ask for matching funds. We're thrilled that Claremont City Council uh, has voted to um, allocate $300,000 of the budget surplus from last year to be spent on park expansion. And in the same vein, last September, our CWC board of directors decided to launch a challenge campaign to try to raise money from the community. We pledged $75,000, which is the bulk of our funds on hand, and challenged the community to match that $75,000 in either donations or pledges. We placed ads and articles in the courier. We had a courier insert, which is shown on the left here. We made a poster for use at the entrance to the Wilderness Park and the Farmer's Market. The Folk Music Center featured the park in its window, showing you a lot of example of a lot of the wildlife that is there. And they also designed a wonderful t-shirt to be given as a gift to those donors who give $50 or more. And two of us here tonight, I think Lissa also is sprouting one of these, one of these t-shirts. And the result has been absolutely heartwarming. Uh, this is a chart that is updated. It's on our website. It's updated every week. So this is as of last weekend. On the left, you can see our CWC donation uh, or pledge of $75,000. On the right, you can see the community response, which is in donations, way more than just $75,000, about $90,000. And in additional pledges, about another $45,000. Uh, $1,000. So at the moment, putting these two together, we have something over $200,000 in community support. But we are not done. Each additional donation is not only valuable for the dollar value, but also helps even more in showing com community support as we apply for grants. And we've been very happy within the last couple of weeks to, to learn that some of our grant applications have been successful. The Rivers and Mountains Conservancy with very important support from uh, our state senator, Anthony Partentino, uh, is giving us $3 million uh, towards the purchase price. And the California Natural Resources Agency has awarded us a grant of 1 million from an uh, environmental mitigation uh, project. So um, that's 4 million plus what the, the community between the city and the donations and the pledges will bring. We're at about four and a half million dollars. We were disappointed not to receive the million that we, we had asked for from Measure A, but there are other county grants that we are now applying for, and we're also uh, exploring several private foundations. So from four and a half million to 7.2 million, we still have a ways to go, but we're very encouraged by the progress that we're making at this point. So we ask you to help please spread the word about the opportunity uh, to your friends who value open space and would like to keep our hillsides free. Uh, there's a website where one can donate, and uh, we would be very appreciative of, of any of your help to, to move us toward that goal. But most of all, we want you to visit the Wilderness Park, go hiking or running or biking or enjoying nature out there, and uh, take advantage of this wonderful, wonderful asset that Claremont has. 
And if you want a peek at the Clara Oaks property, we could probably arrange that as well. So here we would invite you all to our ribbon cutting ceremony when we are successful with our goal. So thanks very much for your attention and your interest and we'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much. That was that was uh, very informative and uh, also very interesting. It's kind of nice you get a, um, a, a, a history lesson about Claremont and I'm I have this weird thing where I really like to look at maps. It's like one of the things that I like to do. So it was very cool because there was a lot of maps and aerial views and you could really understand where things are. And uh, wow, what a great presentation. And you know, it's, it's so funny. I'm gonna give some time. If there's any comments, you can go ahead and type them in the chat or you can raise your hand or unmute yourself, whatever you guys wanna do. Um, it's funny that you mentioned the loop and the wilderness trail because uh, my wife will be doing the loop Saturday morning with a friend of hers. So <laughs> okay. they will be enjoying the wilderness park and uh, the, the, uh, all the, the amenities that it has to offer. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things where uh, I think sometimes people forget that it's there, you know, or, or they forget that it's a resource or they forget that just by being a Claremont citizen, you can go down to city hall, you can get your tag, and you can you can park there for free and you can enjoy it at well not free but at no additional cost for for, for parking um and i think a lot of people just kind of lose sight of that and and forget it i know that when i was a resident here for a little while i thought because i i rented when i was before we bought our house we rented and i thought oh I, well we can't get the sticker because we don't we don't live in claremont well we live in claremont but we don't we don't own a house in claremont and then i didn't realize until like three years later that it's no problem. You totally can. So it's definitely one of those things. I think that um, people kind of, like I said, it, it, they, they, they forget that, it, that it's there as a, a wonderful presentation. Um, and um, do you, I don't know, uh, I guess this question could be for all three of you, really. Um, how do you feel overall like the progress is going? Uh, because from an outsider looking in based on that presentation, it seems like you guys have made a pretty significant impact. Or CWC has made a pretty significant impact on making a difference in terms of acquiring more land to increase the, the, the wilderness park area. So how do you guys feel as board members of the organization? How do you feel your efforts are being received? And do you think you'll be successful? Well, I think the park would not exist as it is today were it not for CWC. Uh, and so to that extent, I think we've made a very big impact and been very well received and we've got a, a good working relationship with the city, with city council and city staff. And and I'm feeling you know very positive about that. Certainly the Claire Oaks campaign, you know, you're feeling both ways, you're feeling very excited and and there's been a big achievement and we've got four and a half million dollars and that's wonderful. Yes. But on the other hand, it's not 7.2 million. So we're not quite there yet. Right. So there's there's more to be done, but but um, we certainly have been very, very pleased with the way things have gone so far. And and how long, how, obviously, so 7.2 million is the goal and somewhere a little over 4 million now. Uh, how how long have you by have has the organization been collecting funds just for Claire Oaks? Um, the so, yeah, um, the the uh, the developer originally offered um, gave us the opportunity to buy it in May of 2018. I see. So we've been working since then to to get the funding. It's it's a a process like this is very slow. It is. It takes tremendous endurance and yeah. patience. <laughs> um, it took us, you know, we we and we've gotten slapped down many times, and sure. we've been on the verge of quitting many times. But um, just just to um, give you the timeline, this last timeline for these two big grants that we just got. And they're the critical ones because once you get that much money in the bank, um, it's easier. Trust Republic Land is telling us because they're the real experts on this. They're telling us um, once you once you get about halfway there, uh, it's a lot easier to get the rest of the money. 
I've heard um, the same thing from other fundraisers. They say once you once you get the ball rolling, the ball rolls easier. And yeah. it, it's kind of a, it seems yeah. like a kind of an oxymoronic. There's thing. an inertia. Think, inertia. Yeah. Right. And you would think that, oh, well, this poor little organization, they're trying to raise seven million and they have nothing. So you think you would start out yeah. quick, but it, it but it's almost like the, it's, it's the opposite. So I, I have heard that before. Yeah. And everyone said from the beginning, 7.2 million is a very heavy lift. Mm -hmm. But uh, we applied for those two grants that we got um, a year ago, over a year ago, a year ago, January, we applied for one, we applied for the other a year ago, uh, just this month or early March. Um, so you have to wait a year to get the money, you know, yeah. if you're going to get it. And that whole time, you don't know if you're going to get it or not. So it's just, it all takes a long time. Also, I don't think we had to be too rigid about 7.2 million. This is a negotiation. Mm -hmm. And um, the developer, as Meg explained, is facing hurdles. There are some significant hurdles to getting the property entitled. Um, so the we have to get a new appraisal. Mm -hmm. um, we just don't know exactly what that amount's gonna be. So this is all in play, but we do know that there are a number of other state grant uh, possibilities, private foundation opportunities. There is some county money that we haven't yet gone to because the next step is to try to get an option with the developer, mm -hmm. with the owner, and then with an option, then we'll have to get the new appraisal and then, then it'll be easier to go out and try to get more funding once we have an option. Mm, interesting. Um, so that I'll just add, it was very bumpy in the beginning. We got turned down um, in various- Again and again. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, it was so, the other thing, another thing that I found really interesting in that presentation uh, was, was the, um, the sort of regional demographic that, that was sort of towards the end where it shows, wow, there's really, yeah. Interestingly enough, there's a lot of people not from Claremont. I mean, a vast majority of visitors are not from Claremont. That's true. And and, and that, that's that's um that's interesting to me. And then you know you I, somebody touched on the fact that oh it's, it's actually more of kind of like a regional park than it is really a, a, a city park. Is there any is there any traction or is there any <laughs> advantage to saying hey you know going to the county of the state or something and saying hey you know what that this is, is really a regional park. Does that open up funding or opportunities or avenues? That's exactly one, one of our arguments. That's Don't a, think we really, haven't tried that one. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, and, it, yeah. and it's to me, that seems like a very sound and reasonable and logical yeah. argument. You have such a large group of people from such a diverse area. And then especially when you factor in that, it, it, I forget what the exact verbiage is, forgive me, but the, but the, um, uh, the, the areas that were in red. Yeah. Uh, the, the the fact that there are so many communities that maybe don't have access to these types of resources or these right. types of things, it really seems like that magnifies the importance of spaces. We think so. Yeah, right. We right? Think so. And if, uh, yeah, and I, I would say it's been a major stress. It, we we've stressed it in all of the applications. The yeah. fact that it, we have people from the whole region coming to the park. But it happens to be in Claremont, and they, you know, they do. They have a scoring system, mm -hmm. and one of the one of the um, you get a score on whether you are park poor, for example. Yes. Uh, well, guess what? Claremont isn't park poor. But, oh. <laughs> uh, things like that. Lisa, do you want to add to that? Yeah, and uh, and th the three things that hurt us when we've gone out for grants are um, that Claremont is not low income. Claremont is not park poor and Claremont couldn't put up any matching funds. Mm -hmm. And when the city, uh, when the budget deficit was so serious over the last few years, the city couldn't come up with anything. Uh, this last year with a small surplus, we're very fortunate. The city has set aside some money that could be used on Clara Oaks. It could be used elsewhere. The city isn't specifying, you know, it's, it's expansion money, but there is, with our local campaign, which has really been successful and which we really need as much money as possible to show that we can, that the community members are providing the match. Mm -hmm. The community is coming up with the match and that has helped us get grants. Uh, we, have, we have conveyed to the grantors mm -hmm. that our local camp, how our local campaign is going, we've kept them informed of it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's, we don't know why we didn't get the county grant. We just found out two days ago that we oh. did not get the LA County 
Measure A grant. And um, there are a lot of reasons. One reason is a very tiny amount of it is for acquisitions of land. Most of it is for urban parks and things like that. We are not park poor, we are not low income. I think those are the reasons we didn't get it, but we're going to find out if, right. if those are the reasons. We, yeah, that we, makes sense. You know, we'll, we will find out from them if, yeah. What I, yeah. And yeah, Brian, go ahead. Yeah, I just, Lisa, I, you know, I hear you being a little bit discouraged. You know, you want to move it along. Well, and not I, now. I want to. <laughs> better I now. You, I want to give you a little bit of uh, a little history, if I could. And Arlene was there at the time, but the city of Laverne, just using them as an example, if you go right by between Corey's house, that driveway that goes right up between Leroy's boys' home, and it goes all the way to the top of the hill and so on. Everything on the east side is in the sphere of influence of Claremont. Everything on the west side is Laverne. The problem is the only water, and I mean the only water between Webb School, which Laverne services, by the way, hmm. but from Webb School, you can go all the way across that mountain range, and there is no other water. The reason I'm saying this, you might want to encourage Randy to make a 503c uh, 501c3 donation to the wilderness park because here's the problem he's got the things have changed over the years especially even since I retired but eventually the water that's up there we will not service the city will not service any more water than what they're serving right now if they need water of any kind, if somebody wants to turn a tap on, they're not going to get it from Laverne. They got to go to Golden State Water. Now, here's where the glitch is for you guys. If they got to go to Golden State, and you remember when they had the fire, you were talking about it earlier up in Claraboya, the pumps didn't work. And there was a lot of problems with water pressure and everything else. Mm -hmm. They know, they meaning Golden State knows that. So the advantage that you have right now, in my opinion, is getting with the developer and saying, hey, you know, 7.25 is out of the question because you can't get water unless you go to Golden State. I can almost guarantee you just looking at the property and knowing exactly where it is and the water that they would have to serve the money that he's talking about getting for the property, it would almost cost him that much because first of all, he's gonna to have to have us, if he has more than one cluster, he's gonna to have to build a series of reservoirs across there. If it's all just in one cluster, yeah, I yeah. guarantee you Cold Golden State is gonna make him put in at least a minimum of 10 million gallon reservoir. That's the minimum. And then beyond that, all the services, everything that Golden State's going to have to do by time Randy Finches is trying to develop that property, he's going to spend almost $7.5 million to do it. Yeah, that should have been in the initial study, you know, uh, the, prior to the environmental impact report. I don't remember the water section, so I'm going to have to take a closer look at that, Brian. Thank you. That's yeah, really take a look at it because there's, and Golden State, by the way, if you, you know, get get Ben Lewis into the picture and talk to Ben and say, point blank, if you had to put water up there, where would you bring it from? Well, they'd have to bring it from baseline. If they take it from baseline, first thing they're gonna to have to do is put in a big series of pumps because they won't do what they did in, Glermo, in uh, Glare, uh, Claraboya. They're gonna to have to put in a series of booster stations across there and then the city because they're in the sphere of influence, the city's going to tell them, okay, now you've got to put a reservoir that's going to match what you put up there as far as development. All of a sudden, either they're going to spend five, eight, ten million dollars on a home, or he's going to walk away from it because I don't think it's it's ever going to happen. And in the situation that you guys are in right now, to me, that's why I don't want you to see anything about uh, getting discouraged because I think right now Thank you're you. at the helm. You are <laughs> at you. the helm. 
and I, I think it's a big advantage because I it just be I just don't expensive. see Golden, I just don't see Golden State being able to do it. And if they do, they're not going to do it cheap. And okay, uh, and Laverne won't do it, even though Laverne provides Laverne will, water to web to the web schools. Laverne, Laverne will not cross from Corey's house on that drive on Williams Avenue, if you will. That goes right up. Williams Avenue goes straight up. Everything on the west side is Laverne. Everything on the east side, but they did grandfather in years ago. Web, web uh, schools. You got the Charter One group, the Live Oak group, the Charter Two group. You got all of those individual little mutuals up there that we're supplying water to. We won't take it away from them. Before I retired, I tried to get them to come into the city and say, hey, you know, we'll take you, but you've got to clean up. And their system is really terrible up there. They can't expand what they've got. They've got to put in new. Mm -hmm. So I'm just telling you, you're at the helm right now. And right. if I was the developer, I would personally, if I was a developer up there that owned all that property, I'd be saying, let's see, they're a 501c3. If I give them the property, they'll give me a decent write-off. And yeah. let's say it's 10 or $12 million. If I was him, I'd be looking at taking that rather than even thinking about developing up there because he's going to spend at least half of that to Golden State Water, at least half. So okay. I'll stop. That's just food for the fire. <laughs> okay. well, thank you, Brian. That sounded like it was very pertinent. Excellent uh, information. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Excellent. Well, again, I just want to thank uh, you three ladies for joining us. Can I just mention one thing, Joe? Yes, please. I, I would like to just say that we are really indebted um, in getting uh, that first big grant that we got for $3 million to Senator Portentino. Hmm. Um, he, uh, he is chair of the Senate, State Senate Appropriations Committee, which is very convenient for us. <laughs> and um, he... He actually showed up in person at the board meeting of the Rivers and Mountains Conservancy, wow. um, urging them to support our project. Well, that's so, wonderful. Um, yeah. He has been tremendously supportive of us, and I think without that support, we would be, we would not be in the great yeah position we're in today. So I just wanted you to know that. And I also wanted you to know that back when I was talking about the Johnson's Pasture campaign and the city council in those days, I think both Corey and Jackie were, I, I, is that Jackie McHenry? I i can't tell from the idea. Yeah, it probably is, yes. Anyway, I think they were both on the city council at that time, so they can fill you in on all kinds of details that I didn't give you. <laughs> oh, good. And then there were a couple of comments in the chat. I oh, don't yes. know. One, and one of them is, uh, did we ask Snoop Dogg? <laughs> yeah. No, we didn't. <laughs> no, but uh, <laughs> that doesn't mean we shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Hey, maybe, maybe he's looking for some write-offs too. You never know. Yeah. That's right. Hey, it, may okay. be, it may be a good deal. He had enough gold on uh, the Rams. Uh, <laughs> That's the true. That alone, oh, like, yeah. He could have paid for it. <laughs> That's true. That's well, very we, true. Our local campaign is still going on, so we, we would welcome your contributions. Um, just go to our website, Claremont Wildlands, you know. Excellent. Claremont Wildlands Conservancy, put it in, and it'll come up, claremontwildlands.org. And, um, and if you know any uh, Snoop snoops who are around now let, let us know <laughs> we, will, we will talk to them okay. yes indeed well again thank you very much for your presentation very well, thank you for inviting us of course thanks no, this, for the opportunity you're you're welcome it's our pleasure this is the exact type of thing that we you know we like to host here at active claremont and bring you know awareness to issues that affect claremont and also the surrounding area and as we've seen this is a I'm going to start using that term. This is a this is a regional effort because this is not only affecting just Claremont, but it's affecting, as we saw, a Absolutely. lot of other cities and people around. So thank you again. Your presentation was excellent. Um, it was full of a lot of great history too, which I'm kind of a history buff, so it was really great for me. As I mentioned, ladies, just so you know, I'll end the recording shortly. Uh, it'll uh, process overnight and then it'll upload to YouTube. I'll, I'll send it out to all of our membership. You guys will be included. You're more than welcome to use any portion of this recorded Zoom for whatever purposes you need to. Uh, it'll Thank be hosted you. on our YouTube channel. Um, and again, one more quick reminder, trash pickup this Saturday. 
um, we'll be there, St. Luke's Church, right on the corner, base, uh, baseline and um, Indian Hill. Please come out and uh, help us pick up some trash and beautify our beautiful city. And uh, until next time, thank you everyone for attending. And uh, we'll see you all in another month for another presentation. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, everyone. Thanks, Bye. Thanks, thank you very much.